So we've got discount rates nailed down, we have the cash flows. This is where the rubber meets the road. Because so far we've been on familiar ground. We've been looking at financial statements and actual prices from the past to back up our estimates. Now I ask you the key question, how quickly will this company grow in the future? The first reaction that most people have is who knows? But in valuation, you have no choice. You have to estimate growth for the future. And you have three choices. You can look at the past, historical growth. You can outsource it. You can ask other people, analysts and management, what they think the growth will be. Or you can try to estimate growth yourself. Based on what? Based on what the company does, how much it reinvests, and how well it reinvests. By the end of this session, I hope to convince you that the third approach is the one that is most consistent with intrinsic valuation. In the last few sessions, we've talked about the first two inputs into valuation, cash flows and discount rates. Today, we're going to talk about the number where the rubber meets the road, where most people start to get uncomfortable. I'm going to ask you about growth. And the reason people become uncomfortable is growth is in the future. In a sense, you're trying to play God, trying to estimate numbers. So let me lay out the three basic ways in which you can estimate growth. One is you can look backwards. You can look at the past. How quickly has this company grown in the last three years, the last five years, the last 10 years? That's historical growth. The second is you can outsource it. You can ask somebody else. In particular, many analysts of value companies ask the managers of the companies what the growth is going to be in the future. After all, they should know their companies better than you and I do, right? Or they look at analysts, other people who look at the company, value the company, and look at their growth rates. And it's easier and easier to get those estimates now for many companies. But I'm going to argue for a third way of estimating growth. I'm going to make a basic thesis. Growth has to be earned. You and I don't have the power to go around endowing companies with high growth or taking away growth from other companies. So let's start with historical growth and why I'm skeptical about whether it's going to give you a sense of future growth. When you talk about historical growth, you think of a number. It should be the same number for every person looking at the company, right? Not true. It depends first on the measure that you're looking at. Whether you're looking at growth in revenues, growth in operating income, growth in net income, growth in earnings per share, you can get very different numbers. Second, it depends on the time period you look at the company. Growth rates over the last three years can be very different than over the last five or the last ten. In particular, if you pick a particularly bad year as your base year, so five years ago was a really terrible year, you're going to get a much higher growth rate. And third, and this again is going to sound like inside statistics, but hang in there, the growth can be very different depending on where it, whether it's an arithmetic average or a geometric average. Geometric averages allow for compounding. They're much more realistic estimates of growth, but they can be either. That's why you can look for the same company on different data services and end up with very different numbers as the historical growth rate. There are a couple of general propositions about growth I want to emphasize. One is growth becomes meaningless when your company's earnings go from a negative number to a positive number. So if your earnings last year were minus 100 and this year it's plus 100, I can't give you a growth rate. I can tell you that last year was a good year, but I can't tell you what the growth rate is. Second, scaling up is hard to do. As companies get bigger, it's more and more difficult to maintain those really high growth rates. Something to keep in mind as you start to do valuation. As a general rule, I look at historical growth rates for companies I value, but I'm not bound by them. In fact, history suggests that a lot of growth rates are not sustainable. Companies that have maintained high growth in the past don't necessarily maintain them in the future. Let's look at the outside estimates for growth, managers and analysts. As I said, managers do know more about the company than you and I do, but they have two fatal flaws. One is they cannot be objective. What manager is going to tell you that he's a rotten manager and he's going to run the company into the ground? Management growth rates, therefore, might not be realistic because managers can't be biased about themselves or unbiased about themselves. They're definitely biased about themselves. Analyst growth rates are bad for a different reason. Analysts are focused on earnings per share. They're focused on the short term and they often can't look past the short term. So if you look at analyst growth rates, they historically have not been very good predictors of long-term growth. So I've ruled out historical growth. I don't trust analyst estimates of growth. Where are you going to go for growth? Look at the company itself. For a company to grow over time, it's got to reinvest a significant portion of its earnings back into the business, and it's got to reinvest it well. In other words, to estimate the growth for a company, 
I've got to look at how much it reinvests and how well it reinvests. And effectively, if you think about fundamental or intrinsic growth, it can come from one of two places. It can, it can come from adding to your asset base, making new investments and earning a return on those new investments, or it can come from efficiency. Let me take the first of those. When you add to your investment base, you can grow. And in fact, to see how much you can grow, I'm going to try to answer those two questions. How much are you reinvesting? How well are you reinvesting? I'm going to try to scale both. Again, to get away from abstractions, let me look at estimating what I call fundamental sustainable or intrinsic growth. They're all used interchangeably in equity earnings and operating earnings. So if you came to me with a company with equity earnings and said, what's the growth rate in the equity earnings in this company going to be in the long term? I'm going to look at the portion of equity earnings, net income, that gets reinvested back in the company. The simplest proxy for that is called the retention ratio. What is the retention ratio? It's whatever you don't pay out. So if you pay out 40% of your earnings as dividends, you've got a 60% retention ratio. And the measure of how well you reinvest, I'm going to capture with your return in equity. So when you invest that equity in a project, what kind of return are you getting? So as an example, again, if your return in equity is 20%, with that retention ratio of 60%, your expected growth in equity earnings is going to be 60% times 20%, which is 12%. When I'm looking at operating income, I'm going to vary those measures slightly. Instead of looking at the percentage of net income that I reinvest, I'm going to look at the percentage of after-tax operating income that I put back into the business in net capex and change in working capital. Remember, we talked about those in the context of cash flows. Net capex here includes acquisitions. It includes R&D. Looking at that percentage tells me how much of the after-tax operating income goes back into the business. So let's say it's 70%. For every $100 in after-tax operating income, $70 goes back into net capex and change in working capital. To see how well you reinvest, I'm going to look at the return on capital. How much you're earning on your invested capital. So let's say you make 30%. You're a great company. 70% times 30% gives me a sustainable growth rate of 21% in operating income. Notice the key number in both these computations is that return number. In fact, if there's a single number in evaluation that I want to get right, it's that return number. Return on equity or return on invested capital. And that scares me. And here's why. It's a one number in valuation where I'm completely dependent on accountants. To see why, take a look at the definition of return on capital. In the numerator, you have earnings before interest and taxes or operating income, an accounting measure of earnings. You multiply by one minus the tax rate, often an effective tax rate, an accounting measure of taxes. You divide by book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash. Notice book value. This is the first place in valuation where we talked about book value. Everywhere else in valuation, we use market values. We use market value debt ratios for cost of capital, market value debt to equity ratios when we lever betas. But when we do return in equity and return invested capital, we look at book values. And here's why. We're looking at what was actually invested in these assets and trying to get a measure of whether they were invested well. So if you invested a little money five years ago and you're making great returns on those, I want to give you credit for that. The problem, of course, with using book values is every accounting judgment, every accounting discretionary call will also affect book value. Accountants can wreak havoc with book value. So return on equity and return on capital are key numbers, but sometimes you might have to go back and adjust what, for, what accountants have done or and basically undo some accounting choices to get to a reasonable measure of return on equity and return on capital. Spend the time, though. It's well worth it. So that's the first way you can grow, is to add to your asset base and do it well. It is also possible, at least in the short term, to grow by becoming more efficient. Let me explain how. Let's assume you have a company with a return on capital of 5%. Not doing very well, right? Let's assume that this company reinvests nothing, but improves its return on capital from 5% to 10%. The year that happens, it's going to double earnings, right? Because instead of making $5, you're now making $10. That's called efficiency growth. And it's going to be a function of how much your return on capital changes as a, fun as a percentage of your original return on capital, which actually creates an interesting implication. Efficiency growth is more likely at companies with really low returns on capital for two reasons. You have more room to improve, and that improvement is going to create a much higher growth rate. So if your return on capital is 4%, you're a much better candidate for efficiency growth than if your return on capital is 20%. Bottom line, though, 
efficiency growth is finite growth. What I mean by that is if you tell me you're going to grow for the next three years, the next four years, by becoming more efficient, I can go along with it. But if you tell me you're going to grow forever with efficiencies, it can't happen. You can only become so efficient and no more. So the bottom line here is when you think about growth, you have to think about those two places you can grow, by taking more investments or by running your existing investments more efficiently. Sometimes, though, when you value a company, you might have to go back to the top line, revenues. Why? Because your company might be losing money. Its margins might be changing too much. So here's a generic three-step process if you run into a company like that. First step, estimate revenue growth. Predict what the revenues will be in the future. I'm not saying that's going to be easy, but that's your first step. Second step, estimate a target margin. Tell me what your margin will be once your company gets through its growth pains. You can look at industry averages. You can look at the company's history. Third step, tell me how much you will need to reinvest to get that revenue growth. To do that, I use a ratio called the sales to capital ratio. Again, it sounds fancy, but here's the way to read it. If your sales to capital ratio is three, for every $3 in additional revenues, I would require to invest a dollar in capital. That'll allow me to estimate reinvestment. So let me take an example to illustrate this process. I'm going to use Sirius Radio in 2006. In 2006, Sirius had revenues of $187 million and was losing more than five times those revenues. Its operating margin was minus 420%. That's horrible, right? My task is to make Sirius a viable company. So here are the inputs I used to kind of bring Sirius into the future. First, I assumed those small revenues become big revenues. So I assumed a revenue growth rate. Take a look at that column. You'll see my revenue growth rates are highest in the early years and they become lower as you go through time. That's pretty much what you'd expect to see for young growth companies. It gets more and more difficult to sustain those high growth rates. The second input that drives this valuation is that operating margin. Look out towards year 10. I have an expected pre-tax operating margin of 19.57%. I got that by looking at Clear Channel, the most mature and most profitable company in this sector in terms of having been around a long time. I'm assuming that over time, Sirius's margins will converge on those. But I'm not going to be unrealistic. I'm going to assume that Sirius is going to lose money in the near term. So its margins will continue to be negative, but over time, the margins will improve to 19.57%. So two-thirds of my task is done. I've made small revenues into big revenues, and as the margin improves, those operating losses have become operating profits. Here's the third loose end. To get from small revenues to big revenues, I have to reinvest, right? How much do I need to reinvest? That's where that sales-to-capital ratio comes in. Every year I take the change in revenues and I look at how much I need to reinvest using that sales to capital ratio. So that tells me how much I'll reinvest. And notice I'm not breaking it down. I don't know whether that reinvestment is going to be in the form of net capex, acquisitions, R&D. With young growth companies, it's tough to gauge. But that reinvestment gets subtracted out from my after-tax operating income to get to free cash flow to the firm. Those three inputs, revenue growth, margins, and reinvestment, drive this valuation. And there's a danger when you do this. If you're not careful, you might create an unsustainable company in your tent. What I mean by that is you might reinvest too much or too little in this company. So to make sure I'm not doing that, here's the final check I run. When you have a reinvestment in a free cash flow to the firm, that reinvestment actually increases your invested capital each year. So since I knew what the invested capital was at the start of the period, I added the reinvestment every year to come up with my estimate of invested capital every year. I divided my estimate of after-tax operating income by that invested capital to come up with the return on capital every year. You're saying, so what? I took a look at what my end return on capital was, what I was estimating as a return on capital in year 10. What I wanted to make sure was that my return on capital in year 10 was a number I could live with, that I was comfortable with. I was okay with the number I got for Sirius. But let's add a, a, the, the number I'd ended up with would have been 3%. That would have been too low. I'd have gone back and reinvested less. If the ending number had been 300%, I was reinvesting too, too little, I'd have gone back and tweaked that number to reinvest more. So when you have young growth companies, use that process to keep your valuations in check. So in summary, growth is a big input. Don't let it overwhelm you. Don't put the onus of certainty on your shoulders. Make your best estimate. Use all the data you have. But remember again, you can't endow companies with high growth. They have to earn it.